Thank you so much for joining me for this podcast and article that I'm about to produce for you. I'm going to talk about the greatest psychology book that's ever written. If you are watching it on YouTube or Rumble, if you don't mind, if you would subscribe to that particular channel, I would really appreciate it. If you want to read the article or listen to the podcast, you can find it all together and I will link it inside the description of both the Rumble and the YouTube video. The greatest psychology book ever written. Let's go. If you want to change your life, you need a self-help book to guide you through the process. The good news is that there is a perfect book for you. It's called The Bible the world's most perfect psychology book. Yes, that's right. I did say it. The best psychology book. And I'm going to explain that in just a moment. There is not a better system of thought than the Bible when it comes to life change. If you're ready for a radical transformation, then we'll keep on listening to this podcast. Hello everyone, this is Rick Thomas. You're listening to Life Over Coffee. I am so glad that you are here. If you're watching by YouTube or Rumble, thank you so much for watching the video. You can read, you can watch, and you can listen. The article that I'm presenting to you is titled, The Perfect Self-Help Book That Will Change Your Life. I would love for you to jump on our website and read the first, uh, read the entire article There are several embedded links in it, and so you could really do a significant dive into this this concept about the world's best self-help book, the world's best psychology book. It is called The Bible. We do have a discuss link on our website, and so if you would like to engage with our team, we would love for you to do that. For those of you who are able, if you are able to support our ministry, we do give our resources away. And if you have the ability to underwrite what we are doing, it's not only beneficial for yourself, these are life-changing resources, but you could partner with us as we take the practical message of Jesus Christ around the world. There are people that write into our ministry on a weekly basis and they talk to us. They tell us uh, what God is doing in their lives through this work. Well, that could not happen without a a small army of people who are underwriting us $10 a month, $100 a year. Uh, Let me tell you what Heather wrote in and said. She said, suffering determines our heart and how we respond to it. It is a litmus test. She is quoting me there. She says, thank you for these posts. I read this site weekly. It is such an encouragement to me. Deborah said, I just wanted to say thanks for your continued faithfulness as you provide truthful resources. God is using you in ways you do not even know. And then finally, Wanda said, I feel like you're reading my journals. I realize your posts aren't directed to me, but they are definitely for me. I also realize the Holy Spirit is working through you on my behalf. God bless you and your ministry. Thank you so much, Wanda. No, we do not have a video recorder in your house. I don't even know who you are, but that is a common something that that folks say to us, and I'm very glad that the Lord hits the nail on the head with our resources. And so if you can help us, if you're able, please make a one-time donation or Uh, You can uh, uh, support us on a recurring basis. All right, so the title of this article, the podcast, and the video, The Perfect Self-Help Book That Will Change Your Life. I want to start with John 17, 17. This is a verse that you can memorize if you haven't already. I love this verse. These are the words of Christ. He said, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And so let's begin at the beginning with God, our non-negotiable presupposition. God is our starting point. And what I mean by presupposition is that he is the window through which we view 
everything in our lives. Now, I'm making an assumption here that you are a Christian. By the way, if you're not a Christian and would like to learn how to become one, just reach out to us and ask, and we would love to be able to walk you to Christ so that you can be born a second time. Regenerated is what we say. Perhaps you have heard the word of being saved, and if you're not saved, then I would love to uh, walk you through how to become a Christian. But if you are a Christian, then your presupposition, the window through which you look at all of life and draw your interpretations, is God. You will never have a more solid foundation, a starting point, a worldview than the Lord. He is the only person who can equip us for living well in his world. But knowing there is a God and that he is our foundation is not enough. We must have a system of thought, a way to think like he thinks. Do you remember what Isaiah said in in 55, 8 and 9? He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, so said Isaiah. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah wrote those words as the Lord was speaking, that God's ways and his thoughts are different from ours. We cannot imitate him if we do not know what he is thinking. Therefore, believing in God or believing that God exists is not enough. We need him to fortify us when trouble comes. We need his words. It would be best if if we did have a way of thinking about the human condition. To be more specific, we need a way of thinking about ourselves. There must be a body of knowledge to guide us into God's truth. If we possess this body of knowledge, then we are ready to answer and engage some of most of life's most perplexing questions. For example, what do you do? Why do you do what you do? Why do you respond to life's trials the way that you do? Why do you affect people the way that you do? Why are you affected by people the way that you are? In Philippians 4 eight, Paul wrote these words, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Well, I am saying to you that these things that we can think on are God's words or what we call the Bible. Now, the system of thought that I am really describing is called psychology. You are familiar with that word, and and some of you may be uh, flummoxed just a bit to know that psychology is the most accurate way to think about the human condition. Psychology is a Bible-implied word. Did you know that? It's just like the word theology. Theology is a Bible-implied word that describes what we know about God. Psychology explains what we know about people. The word psychology is a compound word that means psyche, suke, and logos. The word psyche means soul. We all have one. The word logos means the word concerning the soul, or the study of the soul. And that is what the word psychology means. Some people say the word psyche means mind. Well, that is part of what it means. But whether you are talking about the mind or talking about the soul, the meaning really is the same in that you are talking about your inner being. Humans consist of two parts. We call that a dichotomy. The two parts are the non-organic, or the spiritual part, and then the organic, or physical part. The word psychology points to the non-organic, the spiritual part of a person, their inner being. For example, you've heard the word anthropology. Anthropology is from the Greek word anthropos, logos. It means the study of our outer being. 
Theology is the study of God. Anthropology is the study of humanity. Psychology is the study of the soul. The problem happens when different people groups compete for who knows best about the inner workings of a human being. Who knows best about the soul? This confusion that people have, it doesn't make psychology an inappropriate word. But it can make how we think about psychology problematic. The Christian is in the best position to think correctly about psychology because the Christian starting point is God. The problem is when non-biblical or sub-biblical people groups try to impose their presuppositions, try to impose their worldview on the word psychology. When they do this, psychology becomes twisted and unhelpful. Their reasoning is circular. For example, an evolutionistic presupposition leads to an evolutionistic conclusion. Do you see the circularity in there? And their evolutionistic presupposition that leads to an evolutionistic conclusion, well, that affirms the evolutionistic presupposition. I've completed the circle. This idea would be similar to an anthropologist studying bones and making a case for evolution if he has an evolutionistic presupposition. I expect non-Christian anthropologists to study bones and tell me why evolution is true. Before I became a believer, I bought into many of those conclusions. After I had become a believer... My presupposition, the window that gives me my interpretive filter, it changed dramatically. And when it changed, my conclusions about the study of humanity changed as well. The non-Christian person is entitled to his or her opinions. I'm okay with that. But I am entitled to my opinions and I reject their presupposition. I reject their worldview. I reject their conclusions. Of course, if you talk to them, they would say that they reject mine too. I am okay with that. I really am. Now, this same perspective applies to the field of psychology, not just anthropology. If there is anything they say pertaining to psychology that I accept, then it is because I filter it through a God-centered, bibliocentric presupposition. It can only be valid if it aligns with God's Word directly or indirectly. Minimally, it cannot contradict the Bible's teaching. That is my presupposition. That is my worldview. God's Word is the canon. And the canon becomes the rule from which we determine what is true and false. In Colossians 1.16, it says it this way, For by him, for by Jesus Christ, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether, thor- 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 <laughs> whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, All things were created through him and for him. Well, we could say that all thorns were created by him as well. And Paul would have something to say about that as he received one of those thorns in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass him. But all things were created by God. In Genesis 2-7, we learn that God breathed into this man called Adam, and, and this man, Adam, became animated. He became a living soul. The Lord is the author, and he is the creator of the non-organic, the psychology, and the humanity's organic, anthropology, parts. God made Adam psyche. His soul did not come through random evolutionary processes. It came from the predetermined wisdom and action of God. The Lord thought of the soul. The Lord created the soul. 
The Lord is the architect of the psyche. Now, this truth is a big deal, but it's also a faith issue, which is the same for everyone. Everyone believes what they believe by faith. Again, I'm okay with that. I am a Christian. That is my faith. That does determine my presupposition, my worldview, my belief system. Therefore, my system of thought is uniquely God-centered. Under God's controlling, illuminating, and inspiring power, Paul said, he gives us some insight into how the Bible came into being. You remember God breathed into Adam. He became an animated psyche. And now God is breathing again. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 3.16 that the Lord did breathe, but this time he, he breathed into selected men whom he chose to write inspired words. Those words, breathed out by God, were put into one edition, into one book, and the culmination of this process gave us the Bible. In 2 Peter 1.3, it says this, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. The Bible is a book that tells us about God. It tells us about humanity. It tells us about life. Everything that we know about God, meaning everything that we know about theology, comes from the Bible. No other book in the world gives us new or undiscovered information about God. Any other author from any other book that tells us about God, tells us about theology, gain their insight from the Bible. And the same goes for psychology. All books about God, all books about the psyche, the soul, are either supported or discredited by the clear teaching of God's word. The Lord created the soul. He created the psyche. And he created the logos, the word concerning the psyche. The purest soul book ever written is God's word. Any literature outside of God's word that seeks to explain our souls, our psyche, our psychology, is supported or discredited by the clear teaching of God's Word. Now, it's not wrong for someone to write about the soul, but the litmus test that verifies an author's truth claims about the soul is God's psychology book, the Bible. Thus, based on what I have said thus far, you can conclude the following three things. God created the soul. Genesis 2, 7, God breathed into man. Adam and man became an animated, uh, an animated soul. Number two, God created the soul book. He breathed into men and they wrote the inspired word of God. Thus, God gave us psychology, the word concerning the soul or the study of the soul. The most extraordinary soul or psyche care provider, soul care provider, was Jesus Christ. As Son of God, He created the psyche and He gave us the word concerning the psyche. Imagine sitting on the Savior's couch, being analyzed by Him. He would be able to figure, figure you out quickly and tell you precisely what is wrong with you and what you need to do. We see that so many times in God's Word where someone comes up to Christ and he begins the process of analyzing their soul. Jesus was a master psychologist because he studied the world's greatest psychology book. In fact, you read that in Luke 2.52. It says this, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Well, we know how he increased in wisdom because he was a student of the psychology book. The Christian has a distinct advantage over the non-Christian because when it comes to studying the soul, when it comes to studying psychology, he has God's inspired word. 
the psychology book. Any person who spends their life studying the soul book can grow in their understanding and practice of the purest psychology known to humanity. Non-Christians grope in the dark when it comes to understanding psychology because, <clears throat> because the Bible is a mystery to them, if not downright foolish. In fact, you read that in uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14. It says, The natural person doesn't accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The Christian has the illuminating power of the Spirit of God to guide him into all truth contained in the Word of God. The Christian also has the providential guidance of a sovereign Lord who orchestrates life events on behalf of his children. Additionally, the Christian has a community of psychologists, God's children, who are constantly pursuing a better understanding of the psychology book while seeking to make practical applications for God's glory and each other's mutual benefit. Thus, you could properly conclude the following four things. Number one, you have the word to guide you. Number two, you have the spirit to guide you. Number three, you have your illuminated self to guide you. And then number four, you have the community of faith to guide you. But even with all the aforementioned protective measures, it is still easy to drift from pure psychology, meaning it is still easy to drift from the study of the soul. Problems arise, skirmishes ensue when people deviate from the clear teaching of God's word. Now, I'm not going to elaborate on how psychology runs afoul in all the many ways that it can, but I will mention the most common one that I encounter. God's psychology book, the Bible, versus the world psychology book, the DSM-5, which has gone through, as, the, as it implies here, five iterations. The DSM-5, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which is the book that the world uses to discern the soul. The DSM-5 has its own language, which they communicate typically through acronyms, OCD, ADD, ADHD, PTSD, and on and on and on. The secular psychologist also uses disorder language, meaning most of the problems they describe are disorders. Let me illustrate. Biffy misbehaves at school. His parents take him to a psychologist. The psychologist looks at Biffy. He asks Biffy a battery of questions, and then he questions the parents. He gives Biffy a test to take. The psychologist concludes that Biffy has ADD and sets an appointment with a psychiatrist. The parents take Biffy to a psychiatrist appointment where the psychiatrist prescribes medication based on the subjective behavioral tests that the psychologist took or gave him. Biffy's behavior changes for the better because he is on medication. Therefore, the conclusion is Biffy has ADD. Of course, the diagnosis begins to fall flat when you start asking the right questions. You learn it does not matter to the parents what the psychologist says as long as he can fix their child. Now, I want to give you a sequential a list of questions that I would ask the parents if, if the parents came to me after this scenario that I just presented to you. Here are seven questions that I would ask the parents in logical order, and I want you to listen to how uh, their conclusions begins to fall flat quickly. Question number one, do you like Biffy's new behavior? Yes. Number two, why did he change? It was the medication. Number three, how do you know he had a medical problem? We took him to a psychologist. Number four, what did the psychologist say? He said Biffy had ADD. 
Number five, how did the psychologists conclude? Subjective, I'm inserting this, subjective non-scientific diagnosis. The parents say he asked a few questions. Number six, what was the filter he used to interpret the answers you gave him? The DSM-5. And then finally, number seven, how did the DSM-5 come to these conclusions? I do not know. Now from here, it becomes convoluted. It does not matter how the psychologist came to his conclusions. They will not challenge the psychologist's presuppositions because they like the result. People are pragmatic at heart. Biffy is better behaved. That is a pragmatic acceptance that divorces itself from God's word and probably from all the Lord would like to do in their lives. The tension that I have with this kind of reasoning, the process, and the outcome is that so many of our brothers and sisters have naively bought into the persuasive lies of our secular psychologized culture. Often a Christian tells me about their disorder or how someone gave a relative or a friend a diagnosis and a label with an acronym. They willingly swallow subjective analysis without question, which is befuddling and disheartening to me. This kind of thinking is one of the most significant weaknesses in Christian sanctification, our ability to understand and live out God's practicalized word harms the Christian community as much as anything else that is assaulting it. Our inability to understand and live out God's practicalized word harms the Christian community as much as anything else that is assaulting it. As taught in the Bible, psychology is the best hope for God's church regarding this sanctification. Our desire, my, my desire must be to continue growing and maturing in the study of the soul because we want to be more like Jesus while competently applying it to the souls of the hurting. Learning God's word and practically living it out is the only way that we can do that. The title of this article that I just shared with you, The Perfect Self-Help Book That Will Change Your Life. You can read this article, you can listen to it by podcast, and you can watch it by video. Let me wrap up by asking a few questions in the call to action. Number one, how would you describe your view of God's Word? It would probably be a great time just to stop and reflect on your answer to that question. How would you describe your view of God's Word? If you use this article in a small group context, please talk about it. Share, share your views on what you think God's Word is. Do you see it as the purest form of psychology given to humanity. Question number two, how would you describe your practice of God's word in your life? The first question was your view. That could be theoretical. It could be hypothetical. But now I want you to describe your actual practice of God's word in your life. Are you competently applying it as evidenced? by incremental and objective transformation. Now, the questions that I, the question I just asked you is yes or no. I did ask you how you would describe your practice of God's word in your life, but this would be an excellent leadership opportunity for you right now to talk to someone about how you answered the questions that I've asked you thus far. Maybe someone close to you could give you an assessment. Let them describe your practice of God's word in your life. Maybe that would be a more accurate assessment. And then finally, question number three. What do your responses to life's trials reveal about your understanding and practice of God's Word in your life? And so I have asked you your view of God's Word in your life. I've asked you to describe it. And now I'm getting more specific. What about the last trial that you have gone through? What about the trial that you are in now? 
Are you an effective biblical psychologist when you consider your application of God's Word in your life? Thanks so much for listening.